They are the faces of change, the voices of progress. It starts off with, you know, believing that you can. Uh, even uh, in some cases you don't see it, but believing that it is possible. Impacting North Texas through their vision and action. The fact that we're sitting here like this, it speaks for itself. That's what makes me proud. Honoring the past and inspiring the future. It's not good enough to say you're the only one. Struggle, resilience, success. It's about can we come together and create something that's magical that's going to inspire someone. This is black history. This is our history. Hey y'all, I'm Nicole Baker. And I'm joining you today from the African American Museum in Dallas's Fair Park, which has been a part of the fabric of this community since 1974. So much history here, so much to share with you. And that's why CBS News Texas has spent the last month highlighting the accomplishments and achievements of black Texans here in our area. And we are inviting you for the next 30 minutes to join us to dive deeper into those stories. And we're going to start with photojournalist Mike Griffith, who's giving us a tour of this fabulous museum and showing us how local artists are capturing the true spirit of black history. I think that you're going to experience the variety of emotions to have a deeper understanding about an individual within the context of the whole. This is the 27th National Black Art Competition, Carol Harrison's National Black Art Competition. Black and white is really the way to go, for me anyway. And then when I'm done, I will cut it and then sew onto a bell. Yeah, it's, it's great to have your work in uh, such a place. It's, it's a museum. It's not everybody that will get the opportunity to have your work in a museum. Using different types of media and, um, to showcase the photography. This image is called Faded and um, it's very direct. I was really focusing on the designs in our hair and things like that. Sisterly Love, which talks about um, gender, one sexual orientation, and love. I think capturing a moment in the way that it is in that moment and it'll never happen again, I think that's amazing. I've been 400 submissions from across the country and so what I really love is when people come in here and are surprised. I want my work to be seen. I, I want my work to generate more conversation. And then furthermore, when you engage someone in conversation about that piece, they're going to share information, you know, and you're going to share information. It's going to be an exchange of ideas, regardless of what background you come from. So to have applied and then been accepted, um, it's quite an honor. From very impressive art to all sorts of exhibits where you can learn so much, there is really something for everyone here at the African American Museum of Dallas. The museum is open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And if you'd like more information, you can visit their website. The URL is actually right there on your screen, aamdallas.org. You may not know that every time you drive over Central Expressway in Dallas, you are driving over black history. And I want to tell you more about that. So I have a friend with me, Mr. Donald Payton. He's here to explain it. First of all, I thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I want you, you to tell us what we have behind us here. Well, this is an example of one of the graves from the Freedman Cemetery. And on the walls, these are the people that we found that were buried in the cemetery. We don't know exactly how many, mm -hmm. because when they first started to put the freeway in in the 1940s, they cut off part of the grave, and they took up all of the tombstones and used them for field to put in Central Expressway. And so we found out that it's possibly 10,000 remains buried there. Wow. And so uh, I've got a great, great aunt buried there and a couple of uncles. And it's a very special place to me. Why is it important for people to know about the Freedman Cemetery? Well, first of all, you got to know where you came from to know where you're going. The cemetery is a sacred ground. And if we're not careful, they're going to put apartments over our cemeteries and run freeways through them. And we have to be conscious of that, you see. Thank you, Mr. Payton. You cannot talk about Dallas's black history and not mention the Freedman Cemetery. And we talked about the consequences of slavery. In fact, you may have heard about the 1619 Project. It examines that very thing. And there's a play happening at another North Texas venue that's really celebrating what that project is all about. Here's our Robbie Owens to take us inside that performance. From words on a page. It's stingy social safety net. To new works on the Dallas stage. Director Gabrielle Curlander says the 1619 Project Play Festival allows 
art to be a bridge between discomfort and conversation. Maybe you're hearing something that you don't like, that you don't even agree with, but you're, you're in the room with it. And I think that's important. You know, we can disagree without being hateful. The Bishop Arts Theatre commissioned nine local and nationally celebrated playwrights to pen one-act plays inspired by a chapter from the book. The 1619 Project, a Pulitzer Prize-winning collection of essays from Nicole Hannah-Jones, explores the consequences of slavery in America. That the legacy of slavery is shaping all of our lives, no matter our race. Right? The Hannah Jones recently so spoke about the issue on CBS Mornings. Uh, history is complicated. Men can do great things, as our founders did, and they can do really terrible things. Both and can be true. Both, both are, are true. true. Yeah. And art advocates say can help us face a painful truth. It's stark economic inequality. While still nudging communities forward through connections. I want people to leave and the audiences to come to the 1619 Project Festival and see how they can turn their limitations into love, how they can turn struggle into strength. You see those things in moments in this play. This weekend is the closing weekend for the 1619 Project Play Festival. The last performance is Sunday at 3 p.m. Here I am in the Black Cowboy exhibit at the African American Museum of Dallas, of course. And we are telling the story in this exhibit, the contributions of the black men, women, and children through their ranching efforts from the Civil War through the turn of the 20th century. And there's one cowboy who was a legend of his time. Our Steve Pickett is introducing you to Bill Pickett. Notice the name there. The one true cowboy you need to know about. It is the foundation of Fort Worth the whirlwind of Western heritage, this corridor to cowboy culture, where drovers still hurt longhorns, and today's onlookers tick tock every click and clack, including a salute to America's and Texas's black history. He bulldog right here in this Coliseum. Bill Pickett was the man. Legendary cowboy, rodeo royalty, the creator of steer wrestling. Bill Pickett. Pickett's statue stands as a monument in front of Fort Worth's 116-year-old Cowtown Coliseum. And inside that Coliseum, Pickett's presence remains prominently pictured and photographed on the walls here. All of it, a monument of recognition for a Texan deemed a second-class citizen based on his black skin when he first performed here back in 1908. He performed right here in Fort Worth. He was on the 101 Ranch, and the Coliseum, which sits behind me, is where he did his thing. Pickett's thing is a thing of legend. The skill of steer wrestling, known worldwide in the arena of pro rodeo, has Pickett to pinpoint as the creator of that craft. In the early 1900s, Pickett's legendary bulldogging, the ability to twist a steer to the ground, aided by Pickett's bite to that steer's lip, became the star attraction for the traveling 101 Ranch Wild West show. Thousands came to see the dusky demon, as he was called, to watch him perform at racially segregated rodeos. In 1922, he was billed the world's colored champion, the star of the motion picture, the Bulldogger. His fame and popularity recognized with his induction into the Cowboy Hall of Fame in Fort Worth's National Multicultural Western Heritage Museum, director Jim Austin has a dedicated collection of Pickett's imprint on cowboy culture and items of praise to honor his status of America's best known cowboy of color. He was a true legend of cowboy and more important, a black cowboy a man that represented us proud. And just in case you are wondering, yes, my family lineage is tied to Bill Pickett. Legend has it, my great-great-grandfather and Bill Pickett's father were brothers. Pickett's youngest granddaughter lives in Mansfield today. 90 years after his death, the national rodeo tour that highlights black, Latino, and Native American presence bears his name. The Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo comes to Cowtown Coliseum this weekend. And out front, Fort Worth salute to history in black 
it still stands. Steve, thank you so much for that story and really sharing that connection. By the way, the Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo was in town earlier this month. If you missed it, do not worry. It will be back at the Fort Worth Cowtown Coliseum come May. I'm delighted with the poetry. History was made in the Texas Senate this month. Fort Worth's own Opal Lee, we know her as the grandmother of Juneteenth, was honored with this portrait that will now hang in the Senate chambers. According to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, it is the first time in more than 40 years that any new portrait has been added to the Senate chamber. During Black History Month, we celebrate the accomplishments and achievements of so many who came before us. Keith Russell sat down with a trio of local coaches who tell him they feel one was long overdue. When Duncan Bill's Reggie Samples, the all-time winningest African-American coach in Texas high school football history, was named Texas High School Coaches Association Coach of the Year, there's two people in the world who would not miss this moment. You can say I'm partial, but to me, uh, he has to go down as, as, as one of the greatest, you know, top three coaches in the state of Texas history. I was so happy for you because you can only do so much and you have this accomplished, you have this accomplished, have this accomplished. But at the end of the day, you're going to be judged for winning state championship. Known in coaching circles as the godfather, the only thing missing from Sample's resume was that all-elusive state title, which he got this past season at AT&T Stadium to cap an undefeated season for the Panthers. But as they say, good things come in threes. On that same weekend, Jason Todd helped South Oak Cliff become the first Dallas ISD school to ever win back-to-back -back state football titles. And DeSoto's Claude Mathis earned his first state title as a head coach, helping the Eagles soar back to the top. At some point, you gotta be realistic and you gotta put nonsense to the side and give credit where credit is due. Coaches in our community, coaches that look like me, and uh, well, what I can say is I think we've closed the gap. A gap, however, that still exists. Where does it stand when it comes to your feelings about the acknowledgement, the accolades, the respect you all get compared to your white counterparts? We don't get no credit, only because we have kids that are very athletic. We roll the ball out and they expect us to just go win the game. No, we can coach. We can coach. We have some great kids that are very smart. And the fact that we're sitting here like this it speaks for itself, and that's what makes me proud. What they're most proud of is the three coaches collectively this season alone have a total of 63 players who have earned college scholarships. If they didn't play for us in our programs, where would they be in life? And I think that's a way bigger thing than winning the state championship. Case in point, Coach Todd, way before South Oak Cliff, played for Coach Samples at Dallas's Lincoln High School and got his first coaching job under Samples at Lincoln High. A lot of those life lessons I never forgot. And, uh, you know, I'm forever in debt. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to do this again before it's all over. Somewhere there are young black kids, young brown kids dreaming of accomplishing something special in this lifetime. And it may have nothing to do with athletics. If you had one singular piece of advice to share, what would it be? It starts with believing in yourself. Uh, believe in yourself and never give up on your dream. The moment that you stop and give up, you know, you never know what it could have been. So you always have doubt. So I just say, you know, leave no doubt. You don't sell yourself short by dreaming low. Dream for the highest, you shoot for the stars because it, it can't happen. Now the coaches tell our Keith Russell there are so many more coaches here in North Texas ready to make their mark. So much more work needs to be done, but he does say there's progress being made every single day. In 2017, in fact, Dr. Michael McFarland became Crowley ISD's first black superintendent. McFarland says that as a child, he played football and thought he wanted to be a coach or even an athletic director. But he eventually realized the opportunity he had to make an impact as a superintendent. So it starts off with, you know, believing that you can. Uh, even uh, in some cases, you don't see it, but believing that it is possible. Now he's hoping his students see him and know that anything is possible. Sometimes as journalists, we just get lucky. Sometimes the person we set out to interview turns out to feel more like a long lost family member than someone we're featuring. And that's what happened when I sat down with Gerald Alley. He built his success 
on the backs of his ancestors' wildest dreams and on his own instinct for success. It's not good enough to say you're the only one because it assumed that you were an anomaly. You weren't supposed to be there. But he is here, and Gerald Alley is built to last. It's a legacy. It's why we're here and what we can be in the future. His legacy past and present is as solid a foundation as one of his many projects. You've likely visited more than one of Alley's best, Texas Live, Globe Life Field, and now this, just to name a few. You could debate which is stronger, Mr. Alley, survivor of a benign brain tumor who bikes avidly at 70, or the steel he's providing for the National Medal of Honor Museum. That's been the cornerstone of our mission statement, is to change that perception or what people believe are African-American owned firm given the opportunity. The stakes are always high for Conreal, the largest black owned construction and real estate firm in Texas and one of the largest in the country. We operate on a global basis. We operate for Fortune 100 companies. The Conreal crown rests on the finish line of more than 4,000 projects worth billions that all started with a phone call. There was a lady to call from the city of Fort Worth say, I hear you know a lot about helping small contractors. He admits it was just him and his truck, but she did not need to know that. I said, I will move everything we got to Fort Worth if you agree with this contract. They voted and proved it, and that's how we started in Fort Worth. For Ali, being labeled black and successful can be a mixed blessing. It cuts in a in a positive way that we've gotten to some success. People you ask, well, did you get this opportunity because you're black? I said, well, not as many opportunities I lost because I was black. Blood is thicker than concrete with seven family members working together, including Allie's brother and daughter. It is literally the house that Allie built. We've been blessed to have education opportunities at SMU, Northwestern, MIT, and all this other good stuff, but it still comes back to the service station. His daddy's service station, which thrived in the late 60s. At 15, Allie's mom finally convinced his hardworking dad to take a vacation, and he convinced his dad to let him run it while they were gone. And his first lesson in crisis management pulled in swiftly. The underground gas tanks had cracked and it was pumping water. He knew where to find the insurance papers to fix a major issue with the gas pumps and keep his dad from coming home early. But I said, don't call him, because if you call him, he's not, he's coming back. For him, it's the foundation of everything. We keep it right here because as, as I and my brother walk past it, it sort of grounds us to understand regardless whatever opportunities we had in New York, LA or whatever, it starts in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. With offices now in California and global projects, Allie's ambition was a seed planted early, watered by the very possibility of growing up right across the street from HBCU, Arkansas A&M, where black excellence was expected. I saw a lot of educators, people with doctoral degrees. We had doctors, lawyers, we had judges. Is there a moment where you recall any sort of in your face discrimination sure. that hurt you or that motivated you? It's so many of them after 40 some years, but now I look at it as an opportunity. Mr. Alley isn't just living black history because he's in the Arkansas Business Hall of Fame or because he helped his alma mater hire its first black chancellor or even encouraged the SEC to integrate, not even because he gifted life to dirt piles. As you go out in an open field, it's a ditch, grass. You come back later, People are eating, engaging. It is because he carries the spirit of generations in the corners of his heart that never, ever fold. Don't let one incident be the representation of whether or not you win or lose the game. And yes, Allie's work goes beyond building and beyond business. His brother Troy actually started Allie Scholars, which supports students through educational career and mentorship opportunities throughout the South. I think we can all agree that music is a universal language. It's something that connects all of us, no matter who we are. I think that's why a North Texas teacher is using his love of hip hop to connect to his students. They tackle big issues like bullying, and they do it in a fun way. Here's Caroline Vandergriff to take us inside that Arlington classroom. Antonio Young is a former newspaper reporter Go ahead. turned elementary school teacher. I knew that I was going to have to be more than just uh, a deliverer of instruction. I knew that I had to be that role model. I have kids who say, that's my, that's my school dad, y'all, you know what I mean? But he couldn't have predicted how his passion would ultimately influence his work in the classroom. Once I um, realized that, you know, I could be myself and bring what I already had, you know, because I've been rapping since I was like 10 years old, 
that everything just made sense. It's more than just helping students remember facts with rap lyrics. It's about can we come together and create something that's magical that's going to inspire someone. Sixth graders at Ellis Elementary spend months writing and producing music videos. Wake me up, people stop hitting snooze. Stay focused every day, you don't want to lose. I did a part of verse about how you should like stay in school and how it's not sometimes burning. You can actually have fun and learn from it. From finding motivation Say bye -bye to, all the negativity. to learning about African American pioneers. This is our truth, our treasure, like history so real. Or preventing bullying. When he's in school, he doesn't want to be bothered. The topic isn't as important as the process. It's great. It really doing that stuff makes me more engaged in class because he always brings up the rap video. He just like says like a part of his songs or something. Yeah, like, like to get us focused and like back. Young hopes the music continues to inspire his students never to give up. He says, Mr. Young, I want to college and I want to be a teacher. And I want to be a teacher just like you. And I want to be a teacher that works in urban communities because I know they need my help. And I wouldn't have done it without you. The success stories keep him going, changing lives one song at a time. So one day you'll be a grad. That's all our time for now, friends. We really hope that you not only walked away feeling inspired from these stories, but truly feeling like you learned something about the contributions of the African-American community here in North Texas. I'm Nicole Baker. If you'd like to revisit any of these stories or even take a look at some of our past Black History Month coverage, please head to cbstexas.com and click on Black History is Our History. You'll find that on our homepage.